We are in week seven of our Touched by Heaven series. Uh, by now, you should know what we're talking about. We are talking about the lives of people who have been touched by God and how they are radically changed because of it. And by now, you might have noticed a pattern that, that when we are touched by heaven, when we experience Jesus, it, it's not just that we're saved, like that, that's great, but we experience a new life. We begin to see things differently. And one of the biggest things that we start to see differently that we're going to be talking about today is death. Mwah, mwah. I was like, I shouldn't have come to church today. Uh, the world stops when there is a major death, a, a death of a celebrity, um, a, a senseless killing that happens in our world, these big tragedies that pop up in the news, sometimes the world just stops. But the question is, where do you go from there? What happens after you've stopped? Do you just freeze and shut down? Do you immediately jump into action? Do you, does your mental health spiral and your day is ruined, your entire week is ruined? Do you pray? For some of us, the question is, do you fear death? Is the reminder that we are mortal, that, that there is an end to this life, does that bring fear into your heart? I don't know how you react. I just know my own self. But today, I want to give you, myself, everyone, I want to give us hope. Because I want us to understand that as we follow Jesus, we tell death no. And that's the title of my message because I want us to understand what that means. We tell death no. And we're going to be seeing a few stories of people, Jesus included, who told death, no, you don't get to speak here. This is not how the story ends. And we're going to look at how that applies to us as well. And we're going to get there at sort of a roundabout way, so just hang on with me. We're going to start in Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 24. Jesus is in his hometown of Nazareth, and people are complaining that he's not doing miracles. Jesus replies and says, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's day, when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine in the land. But Elijah wasn't sent to any of those widows, but to a widow in Zarephath in the far off region of Sidon. There were many in Israel who had leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, but not any of them were cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Jesus is talking to people of his hometown and wants them to understand not everybody gets healed. Not everyone gets a touch from God. But we want to pull back the layers a little bit and go to this story of, uh, about Elijah that Jesus is talking about. And this story can be found in 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going to summarize the first bit of the story, but then we'll get into the actual text in a second. This story is a well-known story about the prophet Elisha. He told the nation of Israel, because you have broken the covenant with God, you are going to get everything that God promised you that you would get with rebellion. Rain is not going to come upon this land for over three years. You can imagine in an agrarian society where you are growing crops to feed yourselves, you kind of need rain. And so famine breaks out in the land, and people don't have enough to eat. Elijah is told by God to leave the nation of Israel, to go off to the region of Sidon, which is off in the north. If you remember a few weeks ago, Heather shared the story of Jesus in Tyre, where he, he gave a healing miracle to the daughter of this foreign woman. This story takes place even farther north than that. We ain't in Kansas anymore. God tells Elijah, go to there, and there's going to be a widow there, and she will feed you. Elijah shows up, 
finds the lady and says, hey, can you feed me? And her response is, I'm a widow, AKA my husband is dead. I am now the breadwinner. And that is a difficult situation for women of those days. It's just me and my son. I'm, about, I'm gathering these sticks because I'm gonna make a fire. I'm gonna make la one last piece of bread and then we're gonna die. Elijah says, sounds like a great plan, but first make some bread for me. <laughs> Comes off a little rude, like I just told you we're about to die and you want food first. But for some reason she's obedient to this random prophet of a God that she doesn't believe in. She goes, she makes bread, and it turns out that as she looks in these pots again, the flour and the oil haven't run out. And Elijah says, God has promised you that as long as this famine goes on, this jar of oil and this jar of flour will never run out. And they see it day after day. They keep eating. Everything's going fine. But we're going to pick up in verse 17 where things suddenly aren't fine anymore. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house grew ill. He grew worse and worse, and finally he stopped breathing. The widow said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and to kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him in his arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and he laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to Yahweh, the Lord, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy, which would be an awkward posture to see, and cried out to Yahweh, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's request heard his cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. He gave him back to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of Yahweh from your mouth is true. What I want to pull out of here is that death should move you. Never become desensitized to death. Sometimes when it's so much in our face, we, we forget that this is the fact and the reality of every human being on this planet, and it comes for you and for me. And when we see death in our world, we should care. It should move us to something. This widow is moved to anger. She, she points her finger at Elijah and says, Hey, it's been great with the whole oil and flour thing. Thank you for that. I'm glad that we're not dead yet. But did you come just to remind me that I'm a messed up person and kill my son? She, she has come face to face with the God of Israel, and she now has to make a choice on what her opinion of him is. And this death is the catalyst to get her there. Elijah is moved. He cries out to God, did you bring me to this foreign woman just to kill her son? I don't think so, because you're not a God like that. Elijah, is, he could have just been like, could you make me my bread today? Because that miracle still happened, and I don't know about that, but we, we got to keep going with what we got. He has moved deeply. She does not believe in the God of Israel. We're, we're not in Israel. We're in a foreign land. She doesn't know nothing about their God. But she now experiences something and says, is your God responsible for this? And what does Elijah do? He cares enough to take the boy to the, his own room that he's renting from this lady. He lays out on him, cries out to God, restore this boy's life. And God hears his cry. The boy comes back to life. And because of this story and many others, Elijah will go on to be one of the greatest heroes in the Old Testament. Later on in the New Testament, people are going to look back on Elijah as this huge figure. But what if someone better than Elijah came? 
that this prophet that brought someone back from the dead by the power of God, what if there was someone better than him? The Israelites thought that he was so good and God told them that, hey, Elijah is gonna come and prepare the way of the Lord. And so they're like, Elijah's just gonna come back. But God had a different plan. God had someone that would come back in the spirit of Elijah and God had someone who would come back better than Elijah. So jumping back to the Gospel of Luke, that's where Jesus had told people previously, hey, Elijah wasn't the best. He only helped one person come back to life. So now in the Gospel of Luke, we're going to be in verse 11, but right before this story is a well-known story of Jesus healing a centurion's servant. A centurion, a Roman soldier, comes to Jesus and says, you're different than all of the other people of God. Even though I am not a Jew, I recognize that you have power and authority that has been given to you from on high. Please heal my servant. Jesus does, and right after that story that takes place in the city of Nazareth, we see Jesus go on to perform another miracle. So Luke chapter 7, verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus left Nazareth and went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Then he went up and touched the bier. They were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, oh, I skipped a part. Apologies. When the Lord saw her, wait, as he approached the town gate, a dead person carrying out by his mother, she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town came out with her. When Jesus saw the woman, he, his heart went out to her. That's a very important thing. Jesus' heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up, touched the bier that they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man at once sat up and began to talk. A little creepy. Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Judea spread throughout all of Judea. This news about Jesus spread throughout all Judea and the surrounding country. Jesus gives us an example that I think applies to us today. When you see something dead, you do something. When you see something dead, you do something. Now, just like Heather preached a few weeks ago, when Jesus goes somewhere, he goes with a purpose. And it's always interesting how Jesus goes way out of his way for what we would consider to be a small, out-of-the-way thing. So, Nain, this town that he goes to, is about 20 to 30 miles from Nazareth. So he just healed the centurion's son, and that he and this large crowd go 20 to 30 miles. That's not a one-day journey thing. And when they get there, there's this funeral procession coming out. And at the end of this story, Jesus is going to leave. He is here just for this one thing. So Jesus arrives, and in Jewish society, people would be buried on the day that they die because you don't want to deal with any smells or any issues like that. And so this son of a widow has not been dead long. He's been dead long enough for them to be like, yep, he's dead, to wash the body, to wrap him up a little bit, to put him in a coffin, and to start walking towards the tomb. So Jesus gets there, and it says his heart goes out to this widow. Notice the parallels between the story we read earlier. A widow and an only son. And as Jesus arrives, just like Elijah, he is moved by this scene. And he tells the mom, don't cry. No one's talked to Jesus. No one has asked him to perform a miracle. No one sent him a letter saying, Jesus, please come. Jesus shows up. He left at least a day before to get here 
knowing that someone that he did not know was about to die and they needed to come back. He tells the woman, do not cry. Goes up, puts his hand on it, which is most likely why they stopped because they're like, why is Jesus doing this? By Jesus touching this, he has also made himself ceremoniously unclean. Jesus likes to do that a lot. He likes to push the boundaries of people's comfort levels. And he speaks to the man and says, get up. If we're looking at the parallels between the two stories we've read today, Elijah cried out to God, do something. Jesus is God. Jesus speaks to the body directly and says, get up. The people are amazed and say, God has sent us a prophet, and they miss just how important Jesus is. Because Jesus is greater than Elijah. Jesus did not have to do this whole weird laying down on the body, crying out to God. Jesus just says, get up, and it happens. Jesus is not only better than Elijah, he is God. And for us today, he is also our friend. He is the king of everything. So it's great to see that, yeah, God heals, but how does God himself view death? It's important for me to understand what God thinks of death because I need to change the way that I think to the way that he does. In Romans chapter 4, verse 17, we're going to scatter shot a few different passages. The apostle Paul is talking, and he's talking about Abraham. And he says, as it is written, that God told Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations. Abraham is our father in the sight of God, in whom Abraham believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. We see death and we think the end of the story. God sees death and he brings things back into being that were not. In Luke chapter 20, Jesus is having a conversation with the Sadducees. The, these Jewish people believed that there was nothing after death. There is no paradise waiting for us. When you die, you just go off into the void of nothingness. Jesus fires back at these Jewish people and says, did you read your Bible wrong? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. It's interesting that that last part, to him all are alive, is only found in the Gospel of Luke. Same story in the other two synoptic Gospels of Matthew and Mark, but only Luke pulls out this one sentence that Jesus added, to God all are alive. Because when we die, the body is dead, but we are not just a body. We are a soul that will live on for eternity. To him, all are alive, because after this life, there is something more. Finally, in John chapter 11, the story of Lazarus, Jesus' friend who is dead. Jesus gets a, a, a person coming to him saying, Jesus, Mary and Martha want you to come because Lazarus is sick, and you can heal him. And Jesus takes his sweet time coming. His, his disciples are like, hey, Jesus, it's kind of been a while. <laughs> Don't we need to go and help Lazarus? And Jesus tells them, after he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he's asleep, he's going to get better. Sleeping is good. Jesus had been speaking of his death but his disciples thought that he meant natural sleep. So then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad that I wasn't there so that you may believe, come on, let's go wake him up. Jesus pulls back another layer of how God views death. It's like sleep. He wasn't just talking metaphorically because it says that he was speaking of his natural death and they just didn't get it. God views death as sort of a holdover. I close my eyes, but when I wake them up, it's going to be different. 
And it's interesting that, that the resurrection story that happens there for Lazarus is even more bigger of a deal than even the one that we talked about earlier of the widow's son. Because Lazarus, by the time Jesus gets there, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. Science tells us, not to get all gruesome, gruesome and gross, science tells us that by 72 hours, pretty much all of the internal organs have gone. Roberta can probably know more since she deals with this stuff on a daily basis. But things get gross. There's, there's no bringing that stuff back. You can't go from mush to not mush. I have children, and when my seven-month-old son eats a strawberry, I cannot take what he has done to that strawberry and make it whole again. But Jesus goes to Lazarus four days after he died and says, come out of that tomb. And he comes out completely whole, completely new. So what are all these things that I just scattershot tell us? God says that death does not have the final say. And if death doesn't have the final say, then we need to do something about it. Because Jesus, every time he encountered death, he did something. And God views death differently than we do. When we see something dead, we don't just stop. We do something. I change my view to how God does. We can try to bring dead things back to life. I've been having some great conversations, not only this week, but for the last year, of people's concern that this church is dying. If you feel that way, don't just look at something that's dying and stop. We tell death no. We do something. And if you don't know what that something is, it might be because you haven't been asking yourself the right questions. It might be because you haven't been talking to the people that are doing something. Because when you connect yourself to the people that are doing and we connect ourselves, like we talked about last week, when we connect ourselves to the God of the impossible, we can tell death no. We can tell death, you don't have a place here. And even when it comes, and even when it happens, and it doesn't get reverted, we can still trust God. Because as Jesus said, not every widow got her son back. Not every leper was healed. There are times when the answer is no, but that doesn't mean that God's not moving. That doesn't mean that I lose hope in the God of the universe. And for some of us who fear death, we need to remind ourselves that there is something after, that the life that we live is not a, I'm trying to keep death at bay because I think that I have to earn something before I go to heaven. Jesus died on the cross to earn your salvation. It's been bought and paid for. You do not have to fear death anymore. 1 John chapter 4 tells us that perfect love casts out fear because when we're afraid, it's usually because we're afraid of being judged. If I die, I don't know how God's going to feel about me. But when I experience his perfect love, fear can take a hike. So what's the next step for us? For some of us, our next step is to stop fearing death. For us to connect with God and say, I'm afraid of this. For, for some of us, it's death for ourselves. And for some of us, it's death for others. I've known people, and I know it's very easy to fall into this, but some of us are afraid of the death of someone else, and it runs our life. Whether it's our children, our spouse, our parents, we're afraid. And that is a natural reaction. I'm a parent of three children, and I can't tell you I'm never afraid of what could happen to them. 
but I don't let that fear run my life. I take that fear and I bring it to Jesus and I say, this doesn't belong in my life. I need your perfect love. I need more of it today. For others of us, that's not a problem. I, death, whatever. Not, not to make light of people that struggle with that, but it's just not a big issue for some people. But we need to do something when we see something dying or dead. I need to ask, where am I needed right now? Where do I bring Jesus to? As we talked about last week, this faith connection is not just me and my power that's going to change something that's dead. It's God. I, I can't be Jesus and walk up to the funeral procession and just say, get up, because I'm not God. But I bring God to those situations. And so when I see something dying, I say, use me, Jesus. Here I am, send me. So what is dead in your life? To you, is it this church? Is it a relationship? Is it how you view your spouse? Is it a dream? What is dead in your life? Jesus is calling you today to care about dead things. So let's pray. I'd like to invite the worship team back up to the front and Heather, she's going to pray over communion, but let's pray because we can't do this on our own. Jesus, we need you because death does not get the final word you do. And so Jesus, help us to partner with you well. Help us to bring dead things to you so that you can come and have your way. Jesus, I pray for those of us who are afraid of our own death, our own mortality. Jesus, if we do not know you, I pray we surrender ourselves to you because that is the only place that we will find peace. But if we do know you, God, I pray that your perfect love comes right now in this moment and wipes that fear away. For people who are afraid of the death of others in their life, Jesus, would you wipe that fear away? Would you help us to lift it up to you so that you can have it all? So our lives, this new life that you have given us that you say we can live to the full so that we're not missing out on what you have because we are living lives that are chained by fear. Would you break chains today, Jesus? Jesus, would you put in us an unction to do something? so that when we see something dying or dead, we say, no, this is not the end. I am going to do something today, this week, to change that. Jesus, I thank you that you use us. If you wanted to, you could wipe the board and start over. But you use each and every single one of us to make a difference. You say that in your church, we are a body and every person is vital. Every person is an organ, an eye, an ear, a finger, and every person is vital. And Jesus, when a piece is missing, the body is dying. If I don't have my heart, God, I'm done. So Jesus, help us as a church to be whole, for all of us to be all in so that when we see something dying, we do something about it. Thank you for your grace today, Jesus. I thank you that you are the God of love and you pour that out abundantly. I thank you that everything that we do is not out of our need to be saved. We do it out of joy. We do it out of a response to how good of a God you are. So Jesus, use us today. It's in your name we pray. Amen.